Thank you, Director and Chairman Son. So we will now start our very exciting panel discussion. The panel discussion will be moderated by Professor and Dr. Kaori Hayashi of the Institute for AI and Beyond and of Graduate School of Interdisciplinary Information Studies of the University of Tokyo. So Professor Hayashi, please. Thank you very much. Hello, everybody. And my name is Kaori Hayashi of the University of Tokyo. And it is my honor to be moderating this exciting panel discussion today. And let me begin by introducing our three exciting panelists. First, Digital Minister Audrey Tan of Taiwan. Hello, welcome to our symposium, uh, Minister. <laughs> hello. We are all, hello, we are all very grateful and excited to have you join this important occasion for us. Minister Tan is famous in Japan and the world for her work, among other things in Taiwan's fight against the novel coronavirus through the use of digital technologies. Minister Tan is also well known in Japan for her books, such as The Future of Digital Innovation or Digital to AI no Mirai wo Kataru. Our next speaker, we also have Sputniko, who is associate professor in the Department of Design at Tokyo University of the Arts. Hi, Sputniko. Hi. <laughs> and Sputniko is an artist, designer, who is known for, for her film and multimedia installation works that explore the social and ethical implications of emerging technologies. Her works have been featured in such venues as the Milan International Design Triennial and Mori Art Museum. And last but not least is Dr. Yoshiho Ikeuchi, Associate Professor at the Institute of Industrial Science of the University of Tokyo and a member of the Institute of AI and Beyond. Dr. Ikeuchi heads Biomolecular and Cellular Engineering Lab which studies mechanisms for new neuronal development and related brain disorders using unique in vitro systems. So before starting the panel discussion, I would like to ask each panelist to give a brief initial statement about their interests in and concerns for AI. So first, Minister Tan, please give us your statement. Very happy to be here, and I will start by reciting my job description as Taiwan's Digital Minister. It goes like this. When we see the Internet of Things, let's make it a Internet of Beings. When we see virtual reality, let's make it a shared reality. When we see machine learning, let's make it collaborative learning. When we see user experience, let's make it about human experience. And whenever we hear that a singularity is near, let us always remember the plurality is here. The plurality enables us to work on everyone's problems with everyone's help. And that's the idea of collective intelligence. During the pandemic, there was in Taiwan, and still are in Taiwan, many availability maps for the mask, the PPEs, first sold in pharmacies and then at convenience stores. But it's not an idea by the government. It's not even an idea by the business sector. It's by civic technologists. In the G0V or Gov0 community, there were more than 100 different maps all over Taiwan, catering to, for example, the elderly people who are more willing to use chatbots, the more uh, young people who are okay with automated navigation to the pharmacy that still have those masks available. Even to people who are not uh, very 
um, old <laughs> and uh, like very, very young and in a language that they can understand, for example, um, through this very cute Shiba Inu spoke stock that caused all the young people to spread the idea that if you wear a mask, you protect yourself from your own unwashed hand. And the result of trusting the citizens with real-time open data enabled each and every one of us to think of better ways to distribute the PPEs, to use it better, and also disseminate this knowledge. That's collective intelligence. And when the collective intelligence shows tensions in the society, when people have different positions, that's where AI can help. In Taiwan, we have already institutionalized the use of a system called POLIS, which is AI-powered conversation. What you're looking at is a real conversation in 2015 when people talked about the UberX phenomenon of people driving without professional driver's license, strangers, and charging them for it. But instead of fighting among the polarized ideas on the more anti-social corners of social media, AI in particular, this social sector operated AI called Polis, showed everyone how much of a resonance can people bring from our initial positions so where there are, of course, a lot of ideological differences, the AI through the use of clustering algorithms showed people, actually, we have much more common in uh, ourselves with our neighbors on important issues like insurance, registration, and so on, on the uh, UberX phenomena. And we very quickly put that into a new law and Uber worked with multi-purpose taxis in 2017. And this shows us if we deploy AI in a way that assists our collective understanding, then it's like my eyeglass. It helps me see, but it doesn't compete with me in seeing. It is accountable in the sense that it, if it's broken, I can fix it myself or anyone can fix it. And once it's aligned and accountable this way, then it adapts itself to the societal needs, empowering everyone in a society without resorting to what I call authoritarian intelligence, which is a central planning that uh, deprives the society of the democratic control. So that is what I mean by assistive collective intelligence. And I look forward to have the panel discussion with the two panelists. Thank you. Thank you, Minister Tan. That was a very wonderful and inspiring statement. Next, uh, I would like to ask Sputniko mm -hmm. to give your remark. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm going to go through my slides. Oh, hi everyone. I'm very happy to be here. <laughs> and, um, I'd like to first introduce uh, who I am and what I do. Um, can the slides go on, please? Can you go next, please? So um, I'm an artist, but actually I have a computer science and mathematics background. Could you go up next, please? So I studied uh, maths and computer science at the Imperial College London. And after graduating, could you go next, please? I studied design in the Royal College of Art in London. And after studying design, I, could you go next, please? Um, I became an assistant professor at the MIT Media Lab. So I taught at the MIT for four years and I had my own research group called Design Fiction Group. Could you go next, please? And then um, after that, 2017, I came back to Japan after a few years and I became a project associate professor at the University of Tokyo Institute in Industrial Science. Could you go next, please? And uh, currently, I am an associate professor at the Tokyo University of Arts in the Department of Design. Could you go next, please? And other than uh, teaching and also showing, creating and making works, I'm also giving talks and lectures. For example, I'm, I became a TED Fellow 
from 2019. I'm also a young global leader at the World Economic Forum from 2017 where I gave a talk in Davos, thank you. <laughs> and um, my main research theme is called um, speculative design. And that's um, this idea of design, which was first coined by Professor Anthony Dunn and Fiona Raby in RCA in London. And this is a, a design that asks questions about the future. So this is a design to stimulate discussions about the social cultural and ethical implications of technologies. Could you go next, please? So uh, one project I did in this spe speculative design theme is that this is a project called menstruation machine. So I designed a machine that allows people to experience the whole process of menstruation. And the reason why I designed this machine is that half the population of this planet goes through menstruation, bleeding, pain, all this, all this really nuisance. But I was really concerned with the fact that menstruation in society is often treated as taboo, something that we shouldn't be talking about, something that should be hidden. And I was really frustrated that, well, it's affecting half the population of the planet. It's giving so much trouble, but why can't we talk about this? And why can't we talk about this to think of ways to make it easier, make it better? So that's why I designed this machine that allows everyone to experience this, this um, process and talk about it. Could you go next, please? So um, I, I created the machine and I also made a video which is on YouTube. And when I posted this video on YouTube, it, it became really viral. And then it ended up being exhibited in New York MoMA or Museum of Contemporary Art in Tokyo. This is a show in Germany. So um, this is the kind of way I'm working that I do. I design about technology and I try to ask questions about the future. Could you go next, please? So um, one issue I'd like to bring up in this panel discussion is that Although AI is amazing, it's bringing so many amazing progress developments, there are some really um, concerning topics about the AI. And one issue I'd like to bring up is this issue of bias. So artificial intelligence, um, basically the aspect is basically it learns from the present and the past data. You know, machine learning is all about learning from data which means that it also could learn from the biases that exist in present society. So um, this is a scandal that came up in 2018 and um, Amazon, they were trying to develop, develop an AI for um, hiring, but actually Amazon in the past, they didn't hire that many women. Uh, they were very male dominated um, hiring. So the AI actually learned from the past data that, okay, maybe it's a bad idea to hire women. So Amazon found that this AI tool was actually discriminating against women when the resume had anything to do with female or women. So um, Amazon luckily discovered this bias and they stopped using this AI tool. But I think it's a lucky thing that they discovered this and um, I'm very scared that because AI is such a black box, and especially in Japan when gender gap is not, not very great in Japan, I'm not sure if many people would discover and realize this kind of bias um, existing in AI. Could you go next, please? I'm sorry, I'm a bit over time. <laughs> and another issue is that um, similar things is happening with racial bias. So this is a scandal that came out uh, where um, in the United States, they're using this AI called Compass to analyze the probability of a criminal doing, um, committing uh, offense again. And um, they found that this AI is giving a harsher verdict to uh, people of color. So they, this AI was thinking that black people has a higher probability of committing offense again, which really affects the um, amount of prison sentence, the bail that black people get compared to white people. And this is a big issue. Could you go to the next slide? So sorry, sorry to go over time, but um, the big thing I, I like to really ask today is that, okay, like AI is great, but how can we make AI bias free? And how can we make AI that solves many issues that we have in the world of inequality, 
uh, gender bias, racial bias, and also things like climate change or sustainability. And um, I really hope that Beyond AI can become an institution that really thinks about how to solve these um, difficult issues we have today. Thank you very much. Sorry for the time. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Sputniko. It was a very um, inspiring and also provocative <laughs> statement. You brought up some sort of um, dark side <laughs> of the technologies. And uh, yes, we will discuss that later. And finally, Dr. Ikeuchi, please. Um, thank you much. I'm so excited to be here and also I'm really excited to be part of Institute of or AI and Beyond to the research. Uh, could I have the slide, slide please? Um, so let me introduce myself uh, briefly. Uh, I summarize my uh, resume in three lines. First, I was doing PhD student uh, work on genetic code and protein synthesis, which is really fundamental process and machinery for all the life on Earth. And it, it is very interesting, uh, and it, it uses a lot of digitalness and analogness to uh, make the life uh, able, uh, be able to live. And it's really interesting, but I will not talk about it in detail. But I, I realized that very fundamental uh, uh, machinery, even very fundamental machinery, is repurposed in different ways, and such as uh, forming neurons, uh, shape, and connections. So therefore, I moved my interest uh, to this uh, shape of neurons and did my postdoc research uh, in the United States. But then I came back to the Institute of Industrial Science in the University of Tokyo, and then I started doing this uh, new work on making neural tissues from human iPS cells. Uh, can you go next? So uh, our brain is, uh, you know, uh, we, as you know, that uh, we have different regions uh, within the brains and they execute different functions. And very interesting thing is that those different regions are connected and then they can function. And this is really interesting and unique part of our, our brain, but not, uh, not similar in any other tissue or organs in the body. And in biology, uh, as AI is growing and it is used and it's very exciting, but at the same time, also stem cell technologies are really evolving and that is uh, making it really exciting time now. And as you probably know, human iPS cells can be generated from uh, cells in a body, and which is called reprogramming. And that reprogrammed cells can become anything, any cell type in our body, including neurons. Neurons are the cells that makes our brain, and they're connected, and then uh, they, they process information. And not only that, we can make three-dimensional uh, mini tissues, and it's something called mini brains, and we call it organoids uh, in, the, uh, in the field. And those mini tissue can be generated, and including brain mimicking tissues. But as I mentioned before, brain is really connected and that makes it function. But the current technologies of organoid for brain is just to make a single region or a few regions um, uh, separately. So we decided to make a way to connect them each other in a tissue culture chip that is shown here. Uh, which is developed together with uh, Fuji Sensei. And by that, as shown in the right bottom, uh, in the black uh, dark background, you can see that the mini tissues that are about one millimeter is connected each other by their own extensions that are called axons. And they form synapses, and we, we think that it's mimicking uh, connections within the brain. Could you go next? And what we demonstrate with this is that uh, if you didn't connect, uh, which is shown on left, uh, you can see the activity of neurons are quite periodic, simple, and not so, so complicated. But if we connect it, we're quite surprised, but they really show uh, complex and intense activity. And actually, we think that uh, they can memorize some sort of simple form of information uh, for short term. So we would like to make it long-term memory, and we would like to know why they can uh, really memorize uh, some sort of simple information. So with the uh, Institute, of, uh, Institute for AI and Beyond, uh, we would like to understand more by asking three questions uh, below. Can we know more about circuits in the brain from this uh, in vitro system? Um, we also want to ask a question, can we make them function with the help of AI? And also, it, this is very exciting to be in the group of other people who studies AI 
So we would like to ask the last question of can we or can the research inspire AI development? And we're doing this very, uh, with very talented uh, research associate Tatsuya Osaki and uh, we would like to recruit more people. Uh, I would like to introduce the last uh, slide of, uh, can you go next? Uh, with the uh, little bit of uh, uh, interaction with society. So as Spot Nicholson mentioned that uh, <coughs> RCA does a lot of speculative design and it's really well known for it. And the institute that I'm in, IIS and RCA set up a new uh, a lab that's called Design Lab, who, who facilitate, which facilitates the interaction between scientists and uh, designer and students all together at the campus. And so they they uh, form uh, small projects, and then um, they try to come up with the uh, uh, usage of our technologies uh, into develop deployable products. And here I'm showing three different uh, examples, which I'm not going to be able to go into details, but through the interaction with the non-scientist people or intermediate people, we can know what people really want from a technology or what is lacking at the current technology or society. And through the interaction, we are so inspired and we can apply those ideas into the research and we can accelerate uh, uh, the research and we hope that will be helpful for the society. And that's it from me. Thank you. Thank you. So thank you, Dr. Takeuchi, for your very fascinating presentation. Now we move on to our panel discussion. And may I ask Minister Tan first to kick off our discussion by offering your responses to the statements? Certainly. Um, first of all, I think about the bias issue all the time. Uh, for being a non-binary transgender, I'm always being biased against. Um, very seldomly biased for. Uh, anyway, uh, and so uh, this uh, I feel very clearly. And uh, I think about the mask availability map, about how it looks fair when I first see the map on my phone. It looks like the pharmacy distribution is almost perfectly lined up with the population centers. So I feel very good about it. But just a week after, a uh, member of the parliament, um, VP of data analytics at Foxconn, before she went into the parliament, MP Gao Hong An, uh, interpolated our minister Chen Shizhong saying, you didn't take into account the public transportation times that the rural people need to take to reach its near pharmacy. So even though it looks like the same distance on the map, it's not the same time. Uh, in terms of the cost or opportunity cost for the rural people. So it's actually biased against them. And because we share the open API updated every 30 seconds, Minister Chen Shizhong, our uh, Minister of Health, were able to simply say, legislator, teach us. And I think this quote is very important because it shows that in an evidence-based culture, any bias, as soon as it's discovered, have nowhere to hide. The bias may already be, as Spodnikov put it, in the mind of the planners, uh, but the AI and its visualizations, if democratically controlled, allow the society to have this sort of feedback. And it's always constructive in the sense that every MP or every civic technologist can offer a better way to organize the distribution. And we did fix that um, just 24 hours afterward. So such a feedback system, I think, is paramount if we are to use AI as assistive intelligence. Thank you. So uh, I think uh, the word democrat if democratically controlled is something that we can uh, dig into uh, deeper. So uh, Sputnik, would you have right. some say to it? Yeah, like I, I agree with um, Minister Tang about the feedback system. But sometimes I, I often worry that um, like the commercial incentive can be extremely strong especially with technology. So to develop to the desire to develop something very efficient, something very fast is very strong. And I think we really need to have a strong force. How can we build a feedback system that can be checking on this? You know, because um, we like to, you know, may, maybe it's a good way to think about a tool where you know, normal people could suggest biases or evidences that 
where AI is working against them. But oftentimes, you need to be pretty educated to be able to spot these um, mm. evidences. So I sometimes think like, I, like maybe a research institution needs to really fund that effort to check on this um, really fast development of AI and capitalism. I, I don't know, I wonder what's your thought on that? How, how do we check and how do we create a sustainable feedback loop of tech and capitalism and checking um, right. where it's going? Yeah, uh, I think our current forms of democracy, uh, which was designed for an analog system uh, and at most radio and television system, uh, really um, prioritizes this dissemination, uh, but not so much the feedback. The bit rate of democracy, if it's constrained only to voting, is just maybe four bits every person every four years. And that's very, very small amount of bit rate mm -hmm. in terms of democratic control. So my work on collective intelligence is almost always to increase the bit rate so that anyone who see anything wrong with uh, the AI that's deployed in the society can just go to our national participation platform, join the GOV.TW, which has more than 10 million people using it, so half of the country mostly, and we have more than one quarter of petitions by the people who are not even 18 years old. So the people who are learning this is not thinking about, hey, I have to wait until I'm at the age of vote or when I'm digitally literate or media literate. Rather, their civics class teacher shows them uh, by giving them assignments on starting popular petitions, uh, saying that uh, in order to understand data stewardship in order to understand bias. There's no escape from operating your own, for example, air box that measures air quality that uh, rides into a distributed ledger. And then data stewardship will make sense, which is why we don't call it literacy anymore. We call it competence. Literacy is when you're listening to radio or watching television. Competence is when you are a producer and actively setting the agenda for the society, which is day to day, not once every four years. Yes, thank you very much. So, um, my question would be that how would you uh, nurture this kind of competence, uh, or um, how, what would what is your uh, thought? Would you give us some thoughts about what the ideal education for the kids to be able to empower them to be able to participate in, the, in such a system, democratic system? Yeah, first of all, we heavily prioritize free software in the sense of freedom uh, in our basic education system. This is not just to avoid vendor lock-in, but it's also to make sure that they are empowered instead of feeling a sense of helplessness when the machine's algorithms turn against them. Indeed, if something is free software, it means that every student is free to fork meaning taking it to another direction without uh, violating copyright right, or other so-called intellectual property laws. And this is, I think, number one. It's very important to have the agency over the software and think in terms of code, not in terms of the algorithm. Algorithm uh, is like the, the central planner's way of thinking about society and code is something that everyone can change and that's the first thing and the second thing i think also equally important is to make sure that when the society detects uh, such a uh, bias the discussion takes place in a public infrastructure in for example uh, real world we have a conversation like in this panel in an academic setting uh, or in a public park in a public library in a town hall these are all public infrastructures in the commons but in the uh, online world, if we do not have the sort of participation infrastructure like the join platform, Polis, PTT, which are open source and social sector um, operated, then we're confined to the economic sector, capitalism, surveillance capitalism, operated corners, more like uh, nightclubs and pubs and drinking places, um, which do not actually foster public deliberation. They may have private bouncers and sell you addictive drinks, and it has its place, but that place is not 
public deliberation about the results or uh, the loss of agency to central planning AI algorithm. So have a public infrastructure intentionally invested by the social sector and the public sector is also equally important. Hmm. Very interesting. The strengthening of the free software availability and the public infrastructure are the, were the suggestions. Are you persuaded, <laughs> Spurt Nico? Actually, like, I, I have a question about um, the police tool that um, you just mentioned, because um, communication is a, another big issue I'm interested in, because, you know, communication is often, like these days, like fake news or extremism is much easier to spread online. And you just showed um, just now in the presentation, you try to design a tool that where AI is used to try to find um, similarities between people with opposing opinions. Is that what you said? I, I'd, yes. I'd love to know more about this because... Sure. Right, the design is very simple. Uh, you see your friends and families, not uh, nameless trolls, uh, mm -hmm. on the system. Uh, it's by k-means clustering, so people who feel similar are grouped together. And the uh, main contention points uh, discovered via principal component analysis uh, are uh, projected into two dimensions that are dynamically updated. So the way uh, we input into the system is by looking at one statement, uh, 140 characters, uh, so tweet length, and for example, this was my contribution in 2015. I said, I think passenger liability insurance is very important. It's my personal feeling. There's no right or wrong, but you may agree or disagree. If you do agree, you move toward me. If you disagree, you move farther away from me. It's like an open space technology, but there is no reply button. When there is no reply button, there is no room for troll to grow. Mm -hmm. It doesn't incentivize trolling. And before long, people discovered that uh, we actually agree with most of our neighbors most of the time on most of the issues, simply because we simply agree to disagree on those ideological differences because they do not sell addiction. This is a free software platform that prioritizes a more nuanced understanding uh, common feelings. And by uh, focusing on feelings, not interpretations, it makes us more pro-social. Mm -hmm. hmm. How, how do you feel about the design of the current major communication platforms like Twitter, Facebook, and what happened recently with the United States Capitol riot, where it seemed like there were many conspiracy theorists like QAnon spreading online and it was creating a lot of havoc online. Like, how do you feel about the current design and what are the improvements that could be done? In Taiwan, uh, we have this idea called humor over rumor. Uh, and indeed, the cute Shiba Inu is part of the campaign to make sure that whenever there is a trending misinformation, people just report it, much like we flag spam from our inbox. And uh, the situation of the current generation of more anti-social corners of social media is like an inbox that's almost all spam and just uh, a little bit of it, uh, meaningful communication. And that's, of course, not tenable. But I remember that because I'm, I guess, old enough to remember uh, Bill Gates also used to say uh, email will be broken very quickly if we do not uh, have the postal stamp and charging them uh, for it. <laughs> but it's not soft like that, not through commercial incentives, but rather through people volunteering to flag things as spam. And for international networks like Spam House uh, to signal a untrustworthy spammer so that its email moves to the junk folder rather than to the inbox. And so similarly in Taiwan, we have an immune system from the social sector where people just crowd checks, like through the COFAX initiative, uh, crowd checks anything that is trending or about to trend and make sure that if it has a high R value, then the response to that, which is even more fun, has an even higher R value. So it inoculates people who left a ballot. And I think this is one of the ways to solve it. I'm not saying it's perfect, but it beats censorship in my opinion. Hmm. It's very interesting. Um, so the apply, apply, application of technologies is a key to uh, our discussion, I think. So maybe some thoughts uh, from Dr. Ikeuchi. How, as a scientist, uh, do you think to, 
for example, your tech, your uh, your science, your uh, uh, experiments. What do you think is the appropriate use of your technology that you are now uh, doing research on? Our technology. Okay, so I have to be honest about our technology is really far away from actually deployable product. So as I mentioned last part of the uh, um, slide, uh, I, uh, I showed that we try to interact with the uh, design people uh, to understand what is the need from the society, what is the problem. And we would try to, of course, come up with a scientific solution, in our case, uh, neuronal tissue or neuronal computer or the computer mimics our brain that are made of cells, um, which, is, which is developed, which we, we think is a trajectory from our current research. And uh, we would not be able to really um, sort of um, directly have the solution for that question, I'm sorry, but from the cells, but we would, be able to actually uh, bring up a lot of uh, thoughts and ideas and problems through that course. For example, so if we make the brain-like uh, tissue, that might be actually as biased as our brain, for example. Like that might be a problem, for example. But then we can have that type of discussion with the participants and, and we would be um, sort of trying to addressing those questions by of course, by developing our thoughts, but also try to incorporate others. But um, so the short question in the end is why technology cannot be used directly right now, but we, we, we are quite enjoying the uh, discussion through the design lab. So you are inspiring AI technologists. Yeah, so. I hope <laughs> that's, the, that's the case. So I hope that is bi-directional. Uh, so the, of course, we're not really talking with the general general public. We, we're maybe in the small clusters that are close together in the, the PCA analysis. But anyways, um, but maybe we can have that little window from the society to, to have the, 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 the thoughts and knowledge and uh, we would be uh, like to addressing more. And I hope that's happening more in the, this institute as well. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, the whole, uh, this uh, symposium is uh, about how we best use AI technologies and uh, what can we do about education and also about research and ethics and so on. But uh, we have to pause our exciting discussion now and we have, uh, I, I have many more questions from our colleagues for Minister Tan and uh, I would like to ask, uh, because of the time, one personal question to Minister Tan and one more conceptual one. Uh, is it okay, Minister Tan? Yes. <laughs> and let me start with the personal. Um, why did you change your career at the age of 33? And what drove you to become a political activist? instead of staying as a tech entrepreneur. That has something to do with also the, how scientists, what kind of role scientists play in society and what kind of role political activists uh, play in society and how these two are related together. Would you respond to this question? Sure. Um, in 2014, March, I participated in the Sunflower Movement where we occupied the Taiwan's parliament for three weeks. And the Occupy was a demonstration, but it's not just a protest de demonstration. It's a demonstration in the sense of a demo, like a software demo. Uh, and the demonstration was a very simple hypothesis that the collective intelligence of half a million people on the street and many more online, co-organized by more than 20 NGOs, each specializing, say, in the human rights, in the cybersecurity implications, labor laws, environment, and so on, about a trade deal, can actually deliberate such a trade deal even better than the parliamentarians could do in their formalized hearings. And the demonstration was a resounding success. We showed that with good open space technology and nonviolent communication, people actually understood the 
repercussions of such a trade deal if empowered with the kind of collective intelligence tools that shows them exactly how such a trade deal affects them. And this leads to high quality conversations and make the democracy, well, I guess, more democratic. And it was endorsed by the head of the parliament at the time. And we had a national forum and we collectively decided that we didn't want the parliament to get occupied whenever there is a controversial issue. And we want instead to take such a conversation to the digital realm and anticipate such controversial um, values and so that we can settle on what we call a rough consensus through such exploratory design tools, not last minute occupies. So that's the kind of outside game uh, that brings me into the world of applied collective intelligence in the government when I was recruited as a reverse mentor um, as one of the ministers at the end of 2014. So you are a political entrepreneur. <laughs> that's right, way, that's yes. right. Uh, I'm a politician, uh, you can say that. Yeah. <laughs> Great, yes. And I have a privilege to ask one more question. Uh, it is rather a conceptual question. And how can AI, th and these are, this is a question from all of us, uh, all of the panelists here, uh, three of us. How can AI help us integrate divisive society? Or in other words, how can AI resolve the so this society's deepening rift of inequality instead of strengthening it? Um, and I would like you to uh, address this question by uh, talking to our students uh, what we can do about it. Yeah, um, I think one of the main promises of internet technology is that it's not just for downloading. It's not just for listening to mass communication programs that were already fixed uh, by the programmers, but rather everyone is invited to be not just a programmer to invent your program, but also a civic hacker in the sense that you can take such programs and adapt it to your local need, however you feel appropriate without the explicit permission or even um, imagination by the original designers. So they become more like Lego blocks. Now, it's arguable how much internet has fulfilled its original design spec, but that spirit is always there. It's called end-to-end -end permissionless innovation. So my suggestion is that to think about AI as like fire, which is also a technology. It can burn cities. <laughs> it's very destructive when not used correctly, uh, but we don't uh, restrict the use of fire to just a few elites. Instead, we teach about safety of fire and safe fire use and applied batch processing of food through fire uh, as early as maybe six years old uh, in the kindergarten. It's called cooking classes. And so think of it this way about how to cook for the better and also how to share your recipe with others. Thank you. That's very inspiring comment. Um, lastly, maybe we can have a comment from our panelists, as and yeah. Gyuchi. Um, well, it's been great to talk with Minister Tang and you guys. <laughs> and I, I hope I can see you in person in Taiwan or Tokyo after the COVID crisis. But I think um, another key is um, you know equality in education is so important. You know, open education for people of all class, all gender, all race. And I just hope more, you know, more women should be studying engineering and science, <laughs> especially University of Tokyo needs to work yes. hard on that. And I agree. <laughs> yes. And um, I think more like quality in education leads to um, better AI, better design for AI. So it, it's been great to talk today. Thank you, Thank you so much. Dr. Yeah. Keuchi? Yeah, it's been really pleasure and really fun. And I learned a lot today too. And uh, it's, it's really difficult for us to interact on this uh, COVID situation, including this institute has been doing a lot online. But it is a good thing that we can connect even uh, to Taiwan. It's really nice time also. And we really want to cause more sort of technological intense fire from this institute. And then uh, hopefully that can be applied to the society more in the future. Thank you. And Minister Tan, final comment from you? Final words? Um, I, I wish you all live long and prosper. <laughs>
<laughs> okay. <laughs> well, unfortunately, we have just run out of our time, and I'm sure more can and should be said, but let's save this for the future discussions. And I would like to thank each panelist, and particularly Minister Tan, uh, for joining us from Taiwan amidst, amidst your busy schedule. Thank you very much. And it was a great honor for me to moderate this session. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you so Thank you. much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Now back to Eugene. Thank you very much. Wow, that was, that was really exciting. I wish it could uh, last longer, but we'll just save it for the next time. Uh, thank you once again, Minister Tan, um, Spot Nico, Pro Professor Ikeuchi, and Professor Hayashi for the wonderful and inspiring discussion. Uh, we'll take a break now until 11, 10 a.m., just about 10 minutes, and resume at 11, 10 a.m to introduce the research activities of the Institute for AI and Beyond. Thank you. <laughs>